I am Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, new legal troubles for San Diego hospice. Bad news for the federal government, from the federal government, about two airport control towers in San Diego County. And San Onofre's operators deploy a new strategy in hopes of getting the nuclear plant back online by summer. I'm Peggy Pico. As the weather heats up, so does concern over possible summer blackouts. We'll explain who the power players are and how their recent decisions could affect your energy use. The situation there in 2006 was very bad, terrible. We can't live there. We can't go outside. We can't work in. Anybody there can kill for no reason, you know, that why so we left Iraq. As we mark the 10th anniversary of the war in Iraq, we talk to some of the thousands of refugees who found new homes and lives in San Diego. And a new harp exhibit shows how musicians can push the development of musical instruments. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by The U.S. attorney is now getting involved in San Diego Hospice's bankruptcy case for the first time confirming the hospice owes the government millions of dollars. Investigations producer Joanne Farian joins us from the News Center. Joanne, the U.S. attorney filed documents in bankruptcy court today. What do they say? Well, they were filed on behalf of Medicare, and the U.S. attorney is asking the court to appoint a trustee, now that's a neutral party, to take over what's left of San Diego Hospice. It wants to make sure the remaining assets of the organization are protected because the hospice owes Medicare millions. According to the court documents, San Diego Hospice, quote, itself has estimated its liability to the United States at $50 million. And Joanne, remind us why Medicare and the attorney are involved in this case. Well, the hospice is being investigated, investigated for accepting patients into care who may not have been eligible. It filed for bankruptcy, the hospice did, last month, claiming the uncertainty of its Medicare liability couldn't continue, allow it to continue operations. It has since discharged most of its patients. And with most of its patients gone, what's left of the organization? Well, Duane, it still has some assets, a building and eight acres of land in Hillcrest. Now, that's assessed at $18 million. And there's also the San Diego Hospice Foundation. There's $22 million in that account. Now, whether that can be used to pay creditors will also be an issue the courts will decide. I want to remind viewers, you can see all of the background on San Diego Hospice at kpbs.org slash end of life. KPBS Investigations producer Joanne Farian. Two local airport towers are set to close because of federal budget cuts. The final list includes Brown Field near the border and the Ramona Airport. 149 towers are closing nationwide on April 7th. The Ramona Airport is home to CAL FIRE's air attack unit. Firefighters say they'll still fly, but it won't be as safe. County Supervisor Diane Jacob says the closure will put millions of lives at risk. Southern California Edison wants to rewrite the operating rules for San Onofre. The company is asking federal regulators for a meeting to talk about a license amendment. Letting them run one nuclear reactor at 70 percent power. We'll have more on the request and the region's power outlook coming up in just a few minutes. A San Diego judge upheld his tentative ruling today, backing Mayor Bob Filner in his fight with city hoteliers. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr joins us from the News Center with details on the ruling. So, Katie, remind us what this case was all about and what the judge has uh, ruled. Well, Dwayne, last fall, the San Diego City Council approved the continuation of the city's tourism marketing district. Basically, this district allows city hotels to add an additional 2% tax onto their rooms and then use the money to market the city to tourists. But former Mayor Jerry Sanders neglected to sign off on the district's operating agreement before he left office, and current Mayor Bob Filner has refused to sign it. The tourism marketing district sued Filner in an attempt to make him sign the operating agreement. But today, a Superior Court judge upheld his tentative ruling that says Filner cannot be forced to sign it. And I understand the judge offered a caveat involving city council, right? 
Yeah, next week the city council will vote on a resolution that reinforces their support of the operating agreement. It also states Filner's signature is just a formality and that he has no discretion over whether or not to actually sign the agreement. The resolution also says that Filner has no authority to propose a new operating agreement with the district as the mayor has done. The judge says if that resolution passes, then the district is free to file another lawsuit against Filner if he still refuses to sign off on the agreement. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. A few minutes ago, we told you about Southern California Edison's newest effort to restart San Onofre. The company says the plant is important for meeting the area's energy needs. Peggy Pico has this update on the utility's outlook for the summer. There are a lot of players in the power game going on in San Diego right now, from the PUC to the NRC and the ISO, just to name a few. Here to fill us in on the energy landscape and what the most recent decisions mean is KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John. Allison, thank you for being here. There are so many agencies and companies involved in this, it's really hard to keep track. Tell us um, who some of these key players are. Okay, well, first of all, we have the CPUC, which is the California Public Utilities Commission. They represent the public interest of ratepayers like you and me for energy and water. Then you have Cal ISO, that's the independent system operator. They're responsible for keeping the lights on, so they know where all the energy sources are and they keep the power flowing through the power lines so we don't have a blackout. SONG stands for the San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant. SCE is Southern California Edison, the private company that owns and operates 80% of that plant. And the NRC, finally, is the federal agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which decides whether it's safe to run that nuclear plant. All right, well, let's start at the top. Let's get some details about CPUC uh, because we've been talking about them a lot this week. Yesterday, there was a meeting where they were going to try to decide whether we should have peaker plants built here in San Diego. Tell us, first of all, what a peaker plant is, remind us, and then um, what the decision was yesterday. Okay, so a peaker plant is what the name implies. When you get peak demand for energy in the middle of the summer, when it gets really hot and we all turn on our air conditioners, that's a peak demand. And that's when those plants would click on at 10 minutes notice to fill in the power supply and avoid a blackout. What the CPUC decided was that these two plants that were on the table will not be needed yet. And so they said, no, sdg &E, we don't grant you permission to uh, enter a contract with these two plants. But they may be needed by 2018, so they could be back on the table later. Uh, definitely revisit that. I've, uh, the California Independent System Operator, that Cal ISO that you were talking about, um, they also issued a report this week. Uh, what do they have to say about our power supply for this summer? Well, they said they're assuming that, that San Onofre will be offline, so they were saying that they think they will, that they are guaranteeing that we will be okay in Southern California. They do say, though, that we have a couple of sources of energy less this year than we had last year. So, if it gets very hot, we consumers are almost certainly going to have to conserve more this coming summer to avoid blackouts. And they might send out some sort of notice saying, you know, we're at risk or there something. There will be flex alerts, correct. All right. Who decides if Songs or San Onofre goes back online? That's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission right now. It's Right now it's in front of them, and they are saying that by May or June they could decide whether to let the plant restart at 70% power for five months. Now, just today, actually, the operator, Southern California Edison, said that they will consider the possibility, they'll ask the NRC if they can have a license amendment, which is what they will need if they want to start it and keep running it at 70% power, because and the license now says 100%. And this is, aside from it operating, that this rate payer situation. Southern California Edison, as you said, owns about and operates the uh, plant. 80% of it, um, SDG&E, a for-profit company, uh, our power company, right, our power company owns the other 20%. Um, Edison has long said they want to charge ratepayers. Um, so what's the cost right now and who decides if okay. that's fair. Whether the ratepayer right should continue Absolutely. to pay for a plant that's, let's face it, not producing any energy. That's what the CPUC is currently doing, sort of behind the scenes. They're doing an investigation. This first year, they'll be looking at whether the costs that Edison has been charging us are reasonable, and they're putting off till next year deciding whether the ratepayer right should actually get some rebates. Are we paying for them right now? We are. We've paid already about $200 million towards the six or $700 million that the new steam generators that failed. Uh, cost the the uh, company in the first place. So we're paying for energy we're not really getting. 
Well, we're, they're having to pay for replacement energy. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's costing, at the moment, the rate players are shouldering the burden, and I think down the line there's some question as to whether investors may have to shoulder some of the burden of these problems, too. All right, so this brings us back full circle to the <laughs> CPUC. Back at the top here, what can we expect from this organization uh, in the near future here? Okay, so they are considering this question, and in fact, just uh, this week we had a report from one of the people who are opposing the nuclear power plant saying, look, CPUC, it's not cost-effective to be running this power plant. It's actually cheaper to run alternatives. And they took, they took that analysis from figures produced by Edison itself. Edison is disputing that analysis, though, and, and still saying they really want to try to get the plant up and running again this summer. All right, uh, Allison, thank you so much for giving us this sort of putting this all in context for us. My pleasure. If you want more information about the energy landscape in San Diego this summer, go to kpbs.org slash energy. One of San Diego's most popular hiking trails will be closed two months for restoration and repairs at 1,600 feet. Coles Mountain is the highest point in the city of San Diego, and its well-worn trail has seen its share of accidents and rescues. Fire Station 34 has responded to more than 100 rescues off this mountain in the past two years, near the corner of Navajo and Gulf Crest in San Carlos. A common injury we see on this mountain, uh, people like to run the mountain, go up and down it. Slipping is a uh, very common injury. You'll see uh, arm injuries, ankle, leg injuries. And timing is key to getting an injured person to the hospital, so the department is fully equipped to handle any emergency from the ground or air. Then this bag right here, what we have is a trauma bag. That's going to be your basic dressings. Um, maybe a sling and swath if someone injures their arm or their shoulder, and a tourniquet if someone has significant bleeding. This three-wheel assist basket is used when a helicopter can't get to the mountain. As people spend their last few days enjoying the trail, this area will undergo a major refurbish to make it last longer. We've worked with some Eagle Scouts to improve the trail, and uh, they can only take it so far. It appears that the rocks are getting slick, it's getting slippery, and uh, I think for the sake of the mountain and the safety of the people, it, it's time. I climb almost every day. Paul George says many hikers have created their own unofficial path along the trail. You put a fence up and people go right around it immediately, or they tear the fence down. That's where the two-month restoration project comes in, to repair the main trail and restore the unofficial worn out areas. It does make it more accessible for more people, which is the plus, but the negative is that they, they put fence up and take rock formations down, and so it's give and take. There are three other trails that lead to the mountain, and George says, I'm gonna be climbing up, possibly up Barker's Trail. We just want to advise people it's very steep and it's also um, got loose dirt, so the slipping hazard's are, um, pretty great there, so just to use caution. Rangers know it will be difficult to keep people off Coles Mountain during restoration, but they put up lots of signs to alert the public. This trail will be closed beginning Monday through May 17th. By the way, the mountain was named after ranching pioneer George Coles. George Coles, and that is the proper way to pronounce it, by the way. Coles Mountain, some folks call it Cowles. The U.S. Postal Service has approved the relocation of the La Jolla Post Office. This is a bit of a surprise. The building on Wall Street was recently listed on the National Register of Historic Places. A community task force has been working for more than a year to save the post office. This decision could actually be appealed within 15 days. A new location has yet to be determined. Postal Service says it will be close to the current site. The war in Iraq has been officially over for a year and a half, but refugees are still arriving in the U.S. by the thousands. Many have resettled in San Diego County, specifically in El Cajon. On the 10th anniversary of the Iraq invasion, Fronteras reporter Adrian Florido shows us how the East County community has changed. In a classroom on El Cajon's main street, about a dozen immigrants from Iraq are learning English. They all arrived in the U.S. within the last few months. The Iraq war has been over for almost a year and a half, but refugees from the conflict, thousands of them, are still arriving in the U.S., and many are settling here in El Cajon. 
which has the nation's second largest Iraqi community. Many belong to the Christian ethnic group known as Chaldeans. An easy way to say it. Ten years after the war that uprooted them began, the Iraqis in this classroom, like 24-year-old Nawad Gorjiz, are just now greeting the prospect of new lives. Gorjiz was 14 when the war started, a high school student in Mosul. After several years, his family fled to neighboring Jordan, and three months ago, they were admitted to the U.S. as refugees. He says he wants to establish a new life in San Diego, start from zero. But like many of the roughly 11,000 Iraqis who've arrived in San Diego since the U.S. started admitting refugees from Iraq in 2007, Gorjiz's first challenge is learning the language. We're helping to um, really do sort of an intensive deep dive into rapid acquisition of the English you need for a job. Erica Bouri runs the Refugee Resettlement Program for San Diego's International Rescue Committee, which recently opened a satellite office in El Cajon. We have uh, newly arrived Iraqis and, and we continue to work with them. We have folks who have now been here a couple years and are at sort of a, maybe a different phase in their integration into the community. Basic services like English classes remain important for new refugees, but the first wave of refugees arrived more than five years ago. Some, like Khazam Khashin, who was hired by the IRC, are now eligible for U.S. citizenship. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm applying in a month. Others are beginning to start businesses. And as more people take these steps, Iraqis are becoming a more integral part of the city's fabric. They're not only moving into and residing in El Cajon, they're beginning to define the city. Kebab, two kinds, chicken and beef. We have the shawarma, which is favorite in Iraq. Sadiq al-Bazaz is just one of a growing number of Iraqis who have opened businesses in El Cajon. He opened this bakery and restaurant with his brother just under two years ago, right across the street from City Hall. There's a lot of Iraqi community here in San Diego, so we think it's going to work here. Al-Bazaz's family left Baghdad in 2006. The situation there in 2006 was very bad, terrible. We can't live there, we can't go outside, we can't work in. Anybody there can kill for no reason, you know, that why so we left Iraq. Like many Iraqis who fled, Al-Bazaz and his brothers are educated. He studied accounting in Iraq, his brother civil engineering. But when they arrived in the States, they couldn't easily transfer those skills. They spent more than a year unsure what to do. We have to, to find something to figure it out, so we opened this business. El Cajon Vice Mayor Bill Wells says the drive by Iraqis like Al-Bazaz to open a business so soon after arriving in the U.S. has been a welcome development for the city. Well, from a business perspective, it's been fantastic. I mean, we've, we've seen a lot more innovative business. He says business owners have marketed their shops and attracted shoppers from outside El Cajon. The growth of the Iraqi community and its more visible presence in the city's main commercial strips hasn't gone on without controversy, though. Wells says some residents have raised concerns about the Arabic script showing up on signs and storefronts, but he says most businesses have been open to including English on their signs, too. For his part, Wells likes seeing Iraqis' new influence on his city. It gives us a character that we haven't had before. You know, I, I think that... Uh the influence that the Chaldean community has brought on has really seasoned us and made us more interesting. Adrian Florido, KPBS News. I'm Hari Srinivasan. On the next News Hour, President Obama's Mideast trip moves on to Jordan. Plus, Mark Shields and David Brooks analyze the week's news. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. In tonight's Public Square, KPBS got a variety of responses on our website about Mayor Bob Filner's emergency order to close La Jolla Children's Pool each night following allegations of harbor seal abuse. Recently installed seal cams, as they're called, show what appears to be two people breaching a rope barrier, then kicking, punching, and otherwise harassing a mother seal and her pup, driving them from the beach. Axe Alt L began with Bravo Mayor Filner, but had this to say to the people in this video. These people should be made to perform community service, wearing a sign around their neck stating, I kick and punch seals. But Abalone isn't convinced this was a random act. His argument? I have seen this video many times over, and it is a staged event by the very activists that want to close any beach with seals all on it. Well, SoCal Media Surfer had this solution. There is going to have to be a guard posted or people will still go there, closed or not. 
You can comment on this story or any other KPBS story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or just email us at kpbs.org. It's hard to imagine an artist visiting San Diego would forego the beaches and sunshine to spend most of his time in a small, dark room. That's exactly what San Francisco artist James Kronster will be doing for the next month. KPBS culture reporter Angel Carone explains. My name is James Cronister, and I'm here at Lux in Encinitas, California. James Cronister's artwork is surprising. It's hard to tell what you're looking at. Are they photographs or silk screens? They're actually paintings. Cronister places thousands and thousands of little black marks on a canvas to create detailed images of dense forests and elaborate interiors. The painting that's right behind me right now, um, it's a 60 by 60 oil on canvas. It takes about two months of full-time work, of like nine to five, you know, in the studio, and when it, just like a job. Cronister is the latest resident artist at Lux. For the next month, he'll live and work here. He'll be spending most of his time in this curtained off corner of the Lux Gallery. Cronister looks for an image he wants to paint in old books. His latest series features ornate rooms inside palaces. Cronister creates a grid on the image with tape. He then grids off a corresponding square on the canvas. He projects the image onto the white canvas and turns off the lights. Cronister paints in the dark. He makes small black marks onto the canvas where the projected image is, but he paints in such small detail, he doesn't always know where he's at in the image. I mean, half the time I don't know what I'm painting. I mean, half the time it's some sort of like chair leg obscured in shadow, and I don't know which is the shadow and which is the chair leg. Visitors to Lux can not only see Cronister's work, they can watch him paint. I mean, the program here at Lux is taking off the cloak of the artist process. It's, it's having kids come in here, or adults, adults and kids, um, come in and, and rap with the artist and ask them how they do it, or she does it. And, um, and it's, 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 a, it's very unique in that way. And so I wish I did things like that when I was a kid. Cronister grew up in Helena, Montana, where he spent a lot of his childhood walking in the forest, listening to music. It just sort of felt like a little mini adventure. You know, you could just go out by yourself and and listen to your headphones. I was really into The Song Remains the Same, the Led Zeppelin movie, uh, when I was younger, and still am, I guess. Um, and there was a bunch of scenes, like all the individual members of, the, of Led Zeppelin have their individual dream, dream sequences. And uh, Jimmy Page, the guitar player, his dream sequence was sort of meandering through this darkened forest and sort of scaling the side of this rock face and, and grasping up at this wizard who waved this big psychedelic wand, you know, back and forth across the screen and sort of, and so I kind of wanted to find that wizard, I guess. Cronister visits the forest again and again in his work. He's also created images of famous musicians. For Cronister, music inspires his entire process. The thing that I want to replicate that influences me in my studio the most is the space that is found within music. A good example is LA-based musician Ariel Pink. Pink's early albums had a homemade sound that Cronister admires. Pink would record himself playing all the instruments on old analog equipment. Cronister tries to emulate that sensibility in his paintings. I try to like have that sort of idea of, of them being analog. You know, they're not digital. They're not a photograph. You know, they're not made on the computer. They're handmade. Cronister's been perfecting his painting style for almost 15 years. He's hoping to get pretty far on this new painting while at Lux. You feel very supportive, you know. I mean, these paintings aren't easy to make, and, uh, you know, I'm away from my wife and my cat or whatever, um, but um, it's a very supportive environment. It's really great. It's really great to be here. Angela Carone, KPBS News. I mentioned sunshine when introducing our last story a few minutes ago. Not much sunshine along the coast this weekend, overcast in the inland valleys as well. But we'll see lots of sun in the mountains through the weekend. Desert temperatures, mostly in the 80s. A story of man and music is all coming together at a museum in Carlsbad at an exhibit of harps. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando gives us a look. 
When you enter the Museum of Making Music, you understand the meaning of the word cacophony. This is not a quiet museum. We have a tour of 60 children coming through today. We want people to get hands-on with real instruments. Like the harp, which is the focus of the museum's latest exhibit. We described a harp as a soundboard with strings perpendicular to the soundboard. As opposed to a guitar where the strings are parallel to the soundboard. The exhibit takes us from a replica of an ancient Egyptian harp to Celtic harps with metal strings, to a 1776 French harp from the court of Marie Antoinette, to a modern-day electric harp. I want this exhibition to pique somebody's curiosity, to whet somebody's appetite. You know, this isn't a comprehensive history of the harp. It's little tidbits that show this human need and desire to communicate, to make music. It's part of what makes us human. Tidbits like discovering how the Spanish brought both the Bible and the harp to South America, where the elite instrument was transformed into a folk instrument for cowboys. We look at what we like to call the cycle of music making. That means looking at things like how instruments emerge, how they're made, how they provoke creativity, and how musicians have pushed the development of instruments. And all that is on display at the Museum of Making Music. The harp exhibit runs through September. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Before we leave you, we want to take a moment to say goodbye to a very good friend. Metro reporter Katie Orr is moving on. She's going to Sacramento to cover state news, so you'll still hear her on the radio reporting from the Capitol. All of us here wish her the very best. Katie, you will be missed. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.